Hey, so today's topic will be how you can employ shape language in a more realistic style. It's easy to observe how this kind of works in a lot of other examples that are a bit more stylized or animated. So I'll be showing how a lot of realists and historically how a lot of artists have been employing that in their work and I'll be breaking that down for both characters, environments, lighting and composition. Shape language is a part of all of that. And so before we begin, I just wanted to announce the upcoming content release schedule over on Patreon. So by demand, we're doing some character-based lessons that tackle numerous subjects and styles. Uh, this will be by myself and some professionals I've hired. So remember, you can get all these and access to the dozens of other lessons instantly just by signing up. A huge aspect of design is about imagination and observation. Design itself is a course about problem solving. And for many of us, style can in fact play a huge part of this design process as well. So what defines a style? I'd break this down into two equal parts. Uh, I'd say style is determined by the characteristics that describe a word. Think of this as the way an artist employs form, color, shape, line, etc. Basically a lot of the elements of design. And then combine that with the technique or method that these elements are applied to. And we're here today because one of my patrons asked me, how do you emphasize the theme of shapes or utilize shape language itself without violating realism? They say, you know, it's easy to see and understand with more stylized pieces of work, but how would this uh, play towards a, an imaginative realism sort of style? Since design is so subjective and beauty is often considered in the, the eye of the beholder in this business, it, it can be a very really tricky field to navigate. So often what I try to teach my design students is it's often better to design a character or a world or a setting based on narrative and theme. So you can really derive the look of something based off a very specific goal rather on what you objectively think of as this looks good or this looks bad. And really what that does is it changes the conversation from do I like what this looks like to does this visually say what I'm trying to go for. Often the huge factor that plays into the style is the use of shapes. Are they simple or are they complex? Are they exaggerated or are they plain? Are they graphic or are they subtle? Let's look at a few different ideas to start with here. The Blade Runner franchise, known for its iconic cinematography and fascinating world building, has been portrayed in a variety of styles. While the main movies being live action, of course, are photo real. However, it has expanded to comics and anime. Even the film's own marketing art and concept work portrays different styles. Here in this marketing poster by Masei Kusiara, the film's portrayed in a graphic style reminiscent of 1980s anime. It still retains very realistic shapes and proportion, it's just rendered, think of colored and shaded in a very graphic way, like a comic book. Even the film's own concept art here, by Paul Chadson, employs a richer style combining multiple aesthetics into one. This is merging the graphic styles with the photo density of textures. So just for fun, next I'll toss up a few generalized charts on styles. These factor in physics and the rule sets of a property against how realistic these visuals are. I'm showing this to illustrate perhaps that there's a misconception that something is either stylized or it's not, when actually it's more like a spectrum factoring not just shape or form, but the surface detail to how natural the lighting conditions may be. Right, so here up here we have true to life physics and gradually right as we go in this direction you'll have something quite the opposite of like a typical live action movie also set in reality but there's a lot of things in between right you can have very realistically lit and and presented uh world and and set designs but you know shape and proportion is actually very stylized and then you can have something that looks very realistic like and i think this is some kind of Charlie in the Chocolate Factory or Cat in the Hat, and you can have very realistic, or you can have very wonky and abstract sort of level of physics. Historically now, many artists would have been considered realists, or at least that's how I see it in, in my examples here, but let's see how some of these artists perhaps tweak reality and add a little style. And realistically, I do find you can always stylize the shapes in these types of arts to some degree or another. So here is a good example of how J.C. Leindecker would actually kind of stylize using shape, the gesture, right, and pose 
of these uh, characters and figures. Folds aren't usually this dynamic or that that sharp in a lot of cases, but he's really emphasizing an exaggeration, the tension in them, and he's highlighting some of the forms to give it just a little extra visual flow. There's also a simplification in the actual shapes and posing of the character itself, but I would say this is, you know, still a fairly realistic example. You know, meanwhile, we have uh, compositional elements, and we'll look at further examples of this and modern ones of compositional design. Like we can always find a way to break down and just organize composition by simple graphic, you know, shapes. It, it, they're always visually appealing, and there's a good variety of them here, right? And they all kind of frame the subject. Meanwhile, we have somebody like, uh, you know, Frank Frazetta here that really just realistically and almost in a a very kind of energetic sort of way he kind of groups and organizes light and shadow he plays them and see the even though the moonlight is behind the character that's the light source in the scene we're still dropping in a light on this woman's ass because it's appealing and adds visual interest and on top of that there's of course nice shapes right that go along with all of that. I find you can really improve all of this through practicing observational work and gradually making intentional artistic and design choices that deviate from the source. This kind of comes down to both, you know, it's an interpretation of an observation. You can really see how Norman Rockwell did that here with a lot of his work. So here's some of his paintings, sorry, not the highest resolution, as well as some of the reference photos. Some of them are really on point and one to one, but even when they are, you can see he's either simplifying shapes of the background or he's exaggerating or increasing the angle of a shape on a character to emphasize more action or he's changing the proportions ever so slightly of some characters. Both of these characters aren't quite as stocky, you know, and as stiff. There's a little bit more subtlety added to the shapes and forms, you know, of these characters. A little bulkier, a little chubbier. Everything in real life just tends to be a little bit stiffer and a little more straightforward. Take your photo reference and see how you can subtly enhance it and how you can look for shapes in forms right that are that are visually interesting and as well as trying to get across the idea there's just enough push you know and pull right with enough of these shapes here but it still feels very realistic it's still rendered in a very kind of classically real sort of style sometimes for some of us like julie bell here you the observation comes from combining the best parts of reality right so this arrangement of tigers didn't exactly line up the same exact way that these lights and colors did. So, right, so what Julie's doing is combining different instances of our own reality and then exaggerating and emphasizing that over here in her final painting. Again, a careful use of shape design and really kind of playing up the shapes and forms of the lighting, emphasizing the color temperature of light there. Now in modern game design, you can even see something realistic like, again, like Dragon Age Inquisition from Bioware. A lot of their ideas and theories tend to go about what they need to say symbolically with a character, so why not start with a symbol, right? A simple shape, a primitive shape even, can say a lot for a character. And you can see the progression. And I've worked on game projects that have worked exactly in this sort of mindset and flow. Like you just don't start with the final character, but you think about what that character needs to represent visually and then try to you know, objectively use shapes and symbols to kind of get to that answer. And I think this character, the character of Cassandra, explains that really well. And the the designer here was explaining her theme, right, was all about power and authority, and the trick was using a visual language to tell that story. So they're not, you know, they're not trying to objectively justify what's attractive or what is right or, you know, for that character in terms of those visuals. They're trying to use the shapes to convey, you know, those dynamic angles that reflect her strength and aggression. So does the design reflect what their goal is, right? That's what the conversation, you know, really becomes at that point. And even environmental and storytelling concept artists employ these ideas and theories as well. Look at how Aton Zena here. I mean, this is visually a cool image, but it works really, really well because of how simple it is. I think there's a certain inherent amount of brilliance when it comes to sheer simplicity of things. So this is a simple story of a small shape, right, versus a big shape. And, and when that's shown symbolically like this, of course it will convey itself, right, to a much more visually striking image once you kind of sculpt 
the actual shapes and forms from these initial gestures and ideas. And I've tried that and you know, to various degrees to sex in my own comps, right? I, if I'm trying to convey the feeling of vertical or some kind of highly dynamic uh, scene with a lot of scale and depth, I'll use lots of triangles, lots of angles. Or if I'm trying to present something that represents something stable and stiff and powerful, I'll use a lower angle with a lot more square and geometric shapes involved. Artists like John Park do this all the time from their photo studies, right? They, they're they not taking the study one for one, right? But they're choosing, okay, like I can simplify a shape or a texture here. I can emphasize, okay, like these are small. They're flowing very rhythmically like into there. So see, this is just a little bit more stiff, right? John's has got a little bit better variety a nice clumpy lump shape there, here and here. And of course, characters for added storytelling with a little bit of increased shape language in the background to enhance that sense of scale. And Aton again does this in his own ways here, right? It's all about looking at an, in reality and just putting your own interpretation on there. He's increasing, you know, he probably wants to make this image more simple and more dynamic. So he's thinking, okay, let's add more triangles you know, into here, which helped out flow. There's a lot of weird janky shapes right up there. So he's gonna simplify that and fill it with a nice color that'll balance off, you know, this side, this side, and this side, right? And there's of course a huge simplification of detail itself in the shadows. And he's focusing on the texture that are seen in the more prominent lighter areas. And these guys, you know, like in game design for asset design and Uncharted, even though Uncharted itself is very realistic, it uses a high density of information, the shapes and the, the theory that goes into them, they're still largely very simplistic and very designed, right? The, the artists are designing parts of reality that are eventually make it to these game assets. But you know, trees don't look like this in reality. These are certainly art directed a fair degree. Remember everybody, there is no right or wrong way to go about this. After all, all art is a translation on life or nature itself. There's painters out there like Philip Weber that can paint in a hyperreal style. He literally is painting high resolution photos by hand, stroke after stroke. I don't know why exactly, but that's not really for me to judge but I'm sure it fulfills him. Now compare that to something entirely abstract or something like Mike Manolia's graphic shapes. There's something out there for everybody and it's not a one size fit all. Make conscious style decisions based on what brings you happiness or represents your idea the clearest. I'd say ultimately a forced style never looks as nice as something that comes a little bit more naturally to you and the only way to find that out is to do hundreds of drawings. So guys, get going on though. Hey guys, I wanted to give out a special shout out here at the end of this video to my patron, Aglaya Gorbenko. She's a, a beginner artist, as she claimed, and you know, from Russia here, and she loves stylized environments. Let's just take a quick look at them. Uh, they're really fun. You know, they're obviously really creative and I think very strong structurally here. So her work's got a nice bit of charm to it. She's throwing in some studies. You know, and overall, I think her sense of color and light is absolutely fantastic. So if she considers herself a beginner, I can't wait to see what she's capable of down the road. I mean, these are absolutely filled with charm. Guys, check her out over here on uh, ArtStation. And don't, don't forget to subscribe if you wanna see some more content on the way. Let me know, of course, if you have any questions down below about any of the content I covered. Do take care.